Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Frost Art Museum's Crafty Hour with our featured artist, Morel Doucet. Throughout tonight's program, you'll be joined by different staff members from the Frost Art Museum, including Mariana Ramirez, our Manager of Strategic Initiatives, and Grace Frawley, Senior Administrative Assistant. My name is Amy Galpin, and I'm the Chief Curator here at the Frost Art Museum. It is my great honor to introduce to you Morel Doucet. Doucet is a Miami-based interdisciplinary artist and arts educator that hails from Haiti. He employs ceramics, illustrations, and prints to examine the realities of climate, gentrification, migration, and displacement within Black diaspora communities. Through contemporary reconfiguration, his work catalogs a powerful record of environmental decay at the intersection of economic inequity, the commodification of industry, personal labor, and race. Doucet is an Emmy-nominated multidisciplinary artist who has been featured in numerous publications, such as Vogue Mexico, Oxford University Press, Hyperallergic, Lux Magazine, Miami, and the Biscayne Times. Doucet is a graduate 
of New World School of the Arts. <laughs> Following his time at New World, he went to MICA in Baltimore, where he received his BFA in ceramics. Um, his work has been seen um, internationally and locally at venues such as the Havana Biennial, the American Museum of Ceramic Art in Pomona, California, and the Museum of Contemporary Art, North Miami. We are so thrilled to have um, Morel Doucet's work in the Frost Art Museum's exhibition, Transitional Nature. Uh, please join me in welcoming Morel uh, and join us for a sneak peek into his studio. Hi everyone, um, thank you for joining me. It's a deep honor. Um, so like everyone else, you know, I've been home for the most part. Um, I want to thank the director of the Bakehouse for giving me access to the studio. Um, technically, we're still close to the public, but I've gotten special permission um, to be in the studio. So um, the work that I'm going to show you guys um, essentially is the work I started about 10 weeks ago. Um, it's still a work in progress, but it very much um, correlates to my recent solo show I had back in December of last year. Um, and so this new body of work, um, is, is titled Water Grief in the Six Shades of Death. And so it's a allegory um, to kind of examine the idea that water has been at the forefront and the, the um, witness um, for every last, uh, for every extinction that's happened within our human evolution. And so right now we're in the seventh stage. Um, the last one happened um, a couple centuries ago and so right now with humans um you know we're part of the next wave that's going to happen um and so um throughout um today i'm going to kind of pan give you guys different sectors um in my studio i have work that are present i have works that are almost a decade old so i live with works from multiple genres and pivotal moments within my um life Thank you, Morel. One thing I want to remind our participants is the best way to look at this part of the program is through speaker view. Uh, so Morel, do you want to start by telling us a little bit about this new body of work behind you? Um, yes, so um, the body of work behind me, um, I actually started it off at Oolite Arts. Um, so about two years ago, I was very fortunate to get a residency at Oolite. And you know, um, most people know me more for my ceramic work. And so when I got the call from um, Dennis Show, um, he was like, you got the residency, but we don't have a kiln in the building. Um, how are you gonna make work? And I told Dennis, um, give me the studio and I promise that I'm gonna use it. Um, I have a backup plan. And so most people don't know this, but my foundation is actually painting and drawing. And before ceramic, you know, I've always been doing that. And so when I got the opportunity to be at Ulai, um, I started sort of mapping out South Florida. Um, I would drive in different neighborhoods and the neighborhoods were changing before my eyes. Um, I've been here in South Florida for over 20 years. And over the course of the 20 years, you know, I've seen the people change. Um, but then what I realized was that same tree down the block was still there, that bush was still there. And so it came to me this idea that I could catalog or map out these neighborhoods based on the floor and fauna that were still present. So even though the people were going away and the faces were changing, um, the floor and fauna were holding the memories and the energy of those that used to live in these neighborhoods. So interesting. Great. Um, Morel, maybe do you want to get a little closer to the works um, behind you and then we can ask a few questions and we definitely invite everyone um, in the Zoom call as well as on Facebook. Um, if you have any questions for Morel, we'll be happy to right. ask those of him as well. Um, I know I have a few about the works behind you that you were just saying that you produced um, at Ule and one of them, as we look, they're absolutely gorgeous. Um, one of the, I was curious, you have these beautiful silhouettes of people's profiles. Are these based on real people or is this more of just a, a, a recreation um, of a couple of different people? So they're a combination of real people as well as photographic reference. Um, part of the experience 
is going into these neighborhoods in order to gather the flora and fauna. So as you're looking at the patterns in the body, um, they're made with real plants um, from different neighborhoods um, here in the city. And so um, I, you know, so during these adventures, you know, sometimes I'll talk to a neighbor or an older person on the block and kind of get to know the story of the neighborhood and kind of who live here, um, why are they moving away? And so I use sort of that um, that journey in that moment and try to capture it in the um, image of the work. And so some of the work um, in the very beginning were very like black and white, monochromatic. Um, this new work is more so in color. And so these colors are essentially trying to capture the energy of that neighborhood. And so within each piece, um, there's the title, and then I have a um, label called Carbon Drawing, which alludes to the carbon footprint of that neighborhood. Um, and so um, I'll show you guys a different piece, which is much older. Um, so essentially, um, a um, title could be like, um, like water grief and the six shades of death, and then carbon, carbon um, drawing, and then it would be Little Havana. And so that would be an indicator of which neighborhood I got that plant from. And so um, these plants, you know, they're different forms, different kinds, and they create very unique textures that overlap. And it's very experimental. I don't know what the final product will look like. And so I kind of leave a little bit of room for play and something spontaneous in the process. So this work that we're looking on, um, on your kind of the left the, with the orange background and the cranberry um, portrait, what neighborhood does that represent? So these, um, so both of these works in front of you are from Adapata, um, okay. which is the, the neighborhood that the big house is in right now. And so um, Adapata is a very hot spot. It's, adjacent to Wynwood, which developers have been developing over the past couple of years. Uh, many of the restaurants are being pushed out and there are homes that were purchased for no more than 180,000 20 years ago. And these same ho homes are selling for $3 million. Um, so developers are buying these single family homes um, because they want the access to the land. And then they're taking that land and they're converting it to multi-million dollar condos. Um, and so that's the condition we're in right now here in, in South Florida, here in Miami, where um, unfortunately um, communities of color are being in, in, impacted, you know. Um, those that were fortunate to sell their home and walk away with a million dollar, great for them. But then they bring in a million dollar condo that mm -hmm. the general community cannot afford, you know. And so these pieces um, essentially allude to a little bit of that, where is not really about the definition of the figures, but more, more so the silhouette and the energy of the body. Um, because the body is much more important um, for me that takes up space, that takes up agency of that neighborhood. And so through these silhouettes, um, you can tell that these are people of color, the hair are very textured. Um, I pay very close attention and try to capture that. Um, because these are the features, the aesthetic and sensibilities um, that makes these people beautiful. And so I'm very much focused on that aspect of the body, um, um, which um, kind of how each body varies, the, like the, the, um, the eyelashes. Um, so whatever small kind of nuances I can capture in the figure that makes it stand apart, I try to accentuate that. Yeah. So we do have a question from our audience, um, and Morel, it is, how has the current state of the world affected your ability to create? Um, great question. So as, of, so as a result of COVID-19, um, I've been unable to access my studio. Um, and so my minor is actually in creative writing. And so I've been resorting to writing and reading more. And so for me, um, if you look through my website, if you look at my artwork, um, they're very eloquent titles. And these titles essentially allude to bigger ideas and, and um, things within my work. Um, I like to entice the viewer through beauty and then through the title, they can the um, viewer can disseminate or dissect the work based on how they want to interpret it. Um, and so, yeah, so for me, um, I just 
picked up a different medium, if anything. Um, I've been writing more, I'm asking new poems, and these poems will eventually become titles or new bodies of work in the future. I love that you bring that up, Morel, because I find this series, the title of this series, and the commingling water and grief, um, mm -hmm. Work feels so vital um, here in South Florida because of its, you know, relationship. You know, many artists sort of uh, draw inspiration from environmental concern, but your work um, takes such great inspiration from this intersection of, of race and the environment. Um, I, I wonder too, um, you know, so many of us know you as uh, such an accomplished ceramic artist, um, if you'd be willing to um, also show our audience some of your ceramics in, in the studio. Um, absolutely. So I'm going to pan around in the studio. And so um, I'm going to take you guys through a little bit of my work from my solo show, which I had last year. Um, that show was at the African Heritage Cultural Arts Center, and the title of that show was called White Noise, When Raindrop Whisper in Moonlight Screams in Silence, which is another allegory. Um, and so with this work, um, it was looking at coral reef bleaching and, you know, how communities of color are affected. And so the body of work um, from that solo show, um, it came as a result of me you know, going to different meetings, being in certain rooms, and I was the only person of color um, most mm -hmm. of the time in these rooms. And so when I would talk to my peers, friend, how come you're not going to these meetings? You know, it, it talks about your community, your neighborhood, of what is going to happen in the next 30 to 50 years, you know? And so the response I would get is, oh, I'm busy, I have kids, I have after school practice. And so it wasn't that um, my peers and friends did not care about, you know, climate change, seawater rise. It was because that was not the, it was not the first kind of aspect for each one of them. They had other things they needed to take care of. And so um, about five years ago, um, as a result of that, I started kind of doing a few works, um, taking some data from scientists and trying to quantify that data into works that would reflect different aspects of that. And so that's how it came about the untitled. And then, you know, for me, I always do the work first because the work, the message is such is much more important than the venue. And so after I had about three years of work, um, I, um, I made a post on Facebook one day. I was just like, who wants to give me a solo show? I have this body of work. This is the theme. And then I got a, fl a flood of emails from people. And so for me, um, I knew the work was very um, dear to communities of color. And so for me, um, it felt important that the show was in a Black space. And so the African um, Heritage Culture Art Center was a perfect venue. And they never really had a work or a exhibition of that kind of scale. And so it was a learning opportunity for the venue to kind of put on a museum-like exhibition and then being able to educate the community about the message behind the work. And so um, to kind of show you guys, um, and so with my ceramic work is very labor intensive. Um, I use, uh, I've been using porcelain ceramic for the last couple of years. Um, for me, um, porcelain is a very important material um, because porcelain, um, when you look at it, um, in terms of human history. Um, and at a certain point, um, porcelain had the same monetary value as gold. And so if you were to go into someone's home that was wealthy or had money and um, capital, they would have a piece of porcelain somewhere in their home as a symbol of, of status. And so what I do is I take nature and I elevate it to the same kind of way that porcelain is, um, is, is held in certain culture. And so it was in the portion of work, um, there's different nuances about beauty, decay, um, the nature taking on the body or nature being part of the embody. So the work always encompassed different parts of that. Um, some other works um, in the studio that um, is pretty cool for me is I have works that are also from high school. So this is an old piece from high school that lives in the studio. And so this piece over here, the bug, um, connects back to the idea of the double conscious. Um, me being a Haitian immigrant, um, 
I've always had to navigate the spaces around me. Um, even when I was very young, I remember being in rooms with my parents trying to interpret or translate document, like legal document for them with a basic elementary education. And so I've had to grow up very fast. I've had to mature very fast. And as a result of that, um, the way I perceive the world and the way, um, you know, things move around me, um, I have to reflect and analyze it very quickly. So I don't, so I do not have the, the luxury of wondering if, if things work, I just had to do it as, as is. Um, another work that kind of encompasses work from high oh, school. Girl, I had a question in terms of, oh, um, yeah. uh -huh. uh, you, you know, you Go mentioned back. high school work. Um, when did you kind of decide to become an artist? And what was your family's reaction? Is that, I, when I told my family I wanted to go into art history, it was not well received. <laughs> so, oh, that's an amazing question. Um, so for me, um, I think my teachers kind of decided for me, like, or, you know, within the Haitian culture, um, there's not really this idea of what an artist is, um, but, you know, it was something that my parents did not really know what it was. Um, it was just like, like a, um, back in the elementary school, a art teacher was like, your son has this amazing raw talent. And these are programs um, in specialized school that will take his talent and will nurse and will kind of push the, the um, talent moving forward. So I think early on, um, it was really teachers that saw the skill set in me and they talked to my mom. My mom was open to it and she placed me in, in these schools because, um, you know, like every parent, they want the best education for the kids. And so my mom saw it as an opportunity to get good education and then learn a um, skill set along the way. Um, did she envision me becoming an artist? Probably not. Um, my other, um, if I had a, a, like a second, a second life, I probably would be a marine biologist or an anesthesiologist. So those were my other two passion, um, which is why I think I gravitate towards ceramic because there's a lot of chemistry within ceramic. And so as a ceramicist, um, I have to have a very deep understanding of the elements on the scientific table. I need to understand what each of them do, um, how they affect at different temperatures. And so really, um, these pieces are beyond just aesthetic object. There's an entire science behind making them. Um, certain temperature, like this piece, for example, um, is porcelain as well. It's fired in a kiln, you know, over 1500 degrees. And as a result of that, you know, the shrink, the clay shrinks, um, the cobalt, this is a cobalt black. So this is black, it, it turned this kind of rusted brown color. So there's a lot of chemistry that happens within the work um, that also kind of keeps the work fun for me. Um, some other cool things in the studio that I kind of want to um, highlight for my um, audience is, you know, I'm still, I consider myself a very much um, a emerging artist. And so part of my journey is collecting work from other artists, from my peers. Um, and so within the, my studio, I have work by a few friends um, and other artists that who work I admire. I particularly like buying work from artists of color or Latin X. So on the wall here, um, I have a really good friend. She's a graduate. I've known her since middle school. So same middle school, same high school. Um, she's a Fulbright scholar from Ghana. Her name is um, Shaniqua Brooks. And she learned this beautiful kind of weaving technique in Ghana off of her Fulbright. Um, this is my last, my second to last piece from last year that I brought from an artist from New York named Princeton. He recently graduated from the New York Academy of Arts, amazing draftsman. Um, and so I really, you know, try to find other ways to grow a collection. Um, both pieces, you know, were no more than like two, 300 bucks. Um, they're not expensive. So if you, if you can, you know, so instead of buying food for like a month, I just see that money and invest in artwork for my peers who I really admire. Um, something else I was doing before COVID-19, which is on hiatus right now, it's on the pause, is as artists, we don't really collaborate with each other anymore. Um, so I have a really good friend here in Miami who's another Haitian artist named Stefan Arbrot. And this is like an unofficial collaboration we have started. And so I'm hoping after COVID is, list, is lifted, me and him can develop a unique body of work where our styles can 
mingle or overlap to a certain kind of way. Um, but this is the very early stages of that work. And so it'll be fun, you know. Um, I don't see artists collaborate as often as we do during undergrad. And so it'll be fun for me um, to have an exhibition or a show um, with another artist and kind of seeing how the two styles mix and mingle with each other. I agree, um, Morel. I, I, I agree. And I, I just want to say how meaningful it is that you're shining a light on other artists um, and also bringing up um, the notion of, of collaboration. We are all eager to collaborate with you um, on an art activity. Um, so this is probably a good moment to sort of switch over to the art activity. I want to um, share all the people that are asking questions. We see them. We're going to get to them um, during um, the art activity. We have some good questions for you, Morel. Um, and um, thank you so much. We're going to suggest that you go from speaker view to the gallery view. And I'm going to turn it over to my colleague, Mariana, um, as we transition to the art activity. Great. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm excited uh, for all of you to join us. Um, we've introduced our colleague, Grace Frawley, um, who I'll in a second. She's going to be crafting with us. Um, I also wanted to introduce John Carlos Fernandez, JC, and Carmen Carpio. They will be helping us today by um, keeping check of the Zoom chat as well as the Facebook chat. So um, again, keep sending your questions and um, we'll get uh, have Morel back in just a few minutes after he's finished setting up. Um, so Grace, one of the things when we first talked about this um, idea of Crafty Hour, the idea was that we were going to have a craft beverage. So what did you bring today? So I know the original uh, intention was for craft beer. Um, I'm not a huge beer drinker, so I was a little, a little hesitant. Um, so I decided to go for a craft kombucha route <laughs> from my <laughs> favorite um, local um, kombucha tap room. This is Angry Booch. So I have two flavors here, um, lavender honey, which is like a classic favorite of mine. And then I saw um, that they had a hoppy booch flavor. Um, so I will be trying that tonight. Um, from what I've tasted so far, it has like a nice hoppy flavor, but without it tasting like beer. So um, I'm, I'm technically still in the canon of craft beer in some ways, but yeah. What do you, what do you drink? Where is for? Angry Booch listed? Or where, where are they? Yeah, where are they? So they are in um, Palmetto Bay, like the Cutler Bay area. So um, finally something cool in my area because there's <laughs> nothing, there's nothing down here. So um, I actually met the owner, Christina, at one of FIU's farmer's markets and we just oh, stayed okay. in touch. And then I've just been following her and buying all of her krauts and kombucha ever since. So yeah. <laughs> Great. Well, today I brought um, for one of my favorite places. Um, I'm up in Fort Lauderdale and I have invasive species um, down the street from us. And uh, this is their um, Bach to the future. So it is a dark uh, lager and it is delicious. Um, <laughs> So yeah, we definitely obviously want to support our local uh, restaurants and breweries here. And then so I'll open up for the rest of our staff. Where are some of the restaurants or places that you're really missing right now? Like you just can't wait to get back to. I don't have too, too many places that I'm thinking of. I'm thinking of the Frost Art Museum. I'm, I'm excited to get back there and, and some of the other museums and artist studios. I know Morel is back with us now and um, Morel invited me for a studio visit, a proper studio visit, not a virtual visit when things are better. So I'm, I'm really looking forward uh, to that. Great, great. So Morel, do you want to start us off on um, setting up the act, uh, letting us know kind of uh, the activity and um, then we'll continue asking you questions um, as we go along? Um, sure. So um, I'm going to take you guys on some exercise that I do in the studio. Um, so even though I work in a very organic way, um, there is still a system or a structure in place that keeps it fun and spontaneous for me. Um, and so these are some kind of patterns I do in my sketchbook. And then based off of these patterns, they become color themes for larger works um, when I decide to take, to take them on. And so for the activity, um, you just need um, either some plants. Um, the plants, you can grab them from your backyard. 
um, from a neighbor yard if they let you. Um, for me, you, you want to grab plants that are kind of veiny or has a lot of details. And so um, this is like a good one. Um, use the side that has the most definition on there. Um, if you don't like leaf, you don't like insects, uh, you might kind of make your own stencils. There, these are some stencils that I use for ceramic, but I also use them in other um, forms as well. And then I have a menagerie of like paint, watercolor, um, color pencils. Um, rollers, so whatever you can get your um, hand on, um, essentially for the activity. Um, and so I, I can just kind of begin the activity with you guys. And as I'm working, feel free to ask me additional questions. Um, I can elaborate in any other way um, in, 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 in other things. Great, so you're starting off with watercolor, correct? Um, right now, I'm going to um, add some water to my um, paper. Okay. So I add just enough water to kind of damp the surface, um, but making sure that it's not oversaturated. And then I'm going to use paint. And so this is like a new brand that I'm using. Um, first time actually trying them out. Um, I had I read some good um, things about them on on um, on Amazon, and so I ordered some a couple of weeks ago. And so I like to stick to the primary colors um, and then from there depending on how light or dark it is um, I can add some other colors. Yeah I've, I've noticed that in, in, in practicing for um, doing this activity I've noticed um, I was looking at some of your work and just like the colors that we've chosen and it definitely makes it easier when you do very um, contrasting colors when you yeah. have um, like the silhouette in the foreground and then whatever leaf prints that you have in the background so that is beneficial to me. Yeah. So right now I'm just gonna um, kind of dab the surface. Um, so for me, I have a variety of brushes that I've used. So this is kind of like my little brush kit that has different sizes, different shapes. Um, and so yeah, just kind of have fun, you know, I just pick whatever, whichever brush I think might do the um, job and might go for it. Well, Morel, we just lost, oh, there you go. Sorry, we lost yeah. <laughs> yeah. And then I saw you had a rolling pin as well. Can you explain why, um, what, what that would be used for? Um, so the rolling pin, depending on the leaf, um, certain leaves are very small. And so you're not going to really capture the tiny details, but I might want a general shape of the leaf. And so by adding, by um, adding paint on one surface and using the roller as a, um, as a um, kind of friction, it can capture some kind of pattern from that leaf. I think one of the things too, uh, Grace and I were trying this over the weekend and I think early on one of my big mistakes, I was getting a lot of leaves that didn't have those thick veins and so it was like not leaving a really cool impression, but I actually found some in the backyard. There's this plant called a Tibuchima and the veins are like really like... Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, are you familiar with that? It's... Um, yeah, yeah. I, it's, it's funny. Um, I, 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 I normally gather the plants in the springtime because I find they're the most lush in the springtime. Mm -hmm. And then I try to preserve it throughout summer. And so most of my unpatterned work is done in the spring. And then those kind of take, take me on throughout the rest of the year. Okay. And so Morel, have you always been interested in nature or is this something that kind of you grew more into as you got older? Um, for me, I've, I, when, when I was back in Haiti, I grew up on a farm. My um, grandparents actually raised me um, when I was younger. And so I've always been around like cows, chicken. Um, and then um, when my parents got political asylum, they left Haiti and they came to the US. Um, and so for me, um, when I was little, um, nature were different markers for me. Um, I was able to recall very vivid experiences based on the environment I was in. And so I know, um, so when, when, I, when, when I left Haiti, I left Haiti when I was like two and I moved to Mobile, Alabama. And I remember while in Mobile, I knew we came in the fall because the sun had disappeared, the trees were dying. Mm -hmm. um, and so it was my first time seeing like the leaves fall off of a tree. 
um, first time coming across a, um, a red jade. And so even though I was two, those were very vivid memories for me because the environment was unfamiliar. And so somehow in my memories, um, those became the kind of markers um, to kind of hold on to that memory for me. Okay. What do you, do you have memories of Haiti from when you were little? Um, the only thing I remember when I was Haiti is actually the journey um, that my parents took. Um, so when he got to political asylum, it was a very tumultuous time back on the island. Um, Haiti was essentially ruled under a um, dictator. Um, there was a lot of murder happening. So I remember um, being carried on the back of my uncles through like the side of the, through like over like deep valleys of mountain and then taking the outbacks on a horse to cross streams and, and river. So somehow I remember like the journey, but not really parts of my childhood because I was very young, but just mm -hmm. that again, that experience of leaving home in the mountain and traveling through the valleys from one location to the next is what really stayed with me. And then within my young adult life, um, I had the opportunity to go to Haiti before the um, earthquake. And so again, my only memory of Haiti is what it looks like before the earthquake. And so I essentially live in this kind of form of nil um, nostalgia of what Haiti used to be, what is not anymore. And so if I, if I were to visit a certain town, I probably would not recognize it because my memory of that town is before the earthquake. Mm. Oh, well, thank you so much for sharing that story with us. Um, so what are you, so right now you've now um, painted the sheet um, with a uh, uh, watercolor yellow. Um, so you wet it and then put the paint on. Um. Yeah, and so I kind of added like a, a wash first down and then um, something depending on, you know, how dry the paper is right now, it's still a little bit wet, but I'm just going to continue on with the activity. Um, I'm going to kind of use one of my um, stencils. This is a um, stencil of a palm leaf. And so I kind of, you know, find a composition. I would lay down the stencil. And then from there, um, add the application of paint or watercolor. So if you want something cl um, cleaner, you would wait longer until the paper is dry. But for this activity, I'm just going to go ahead and kind of start um, applying it on. OK. So, Morel, do you have like a lot of house plants at home as well? Um, not at home, but I have in my backyard. Um, I have a couple mango trees, some papaya trees. Um, and so I think very much um, you find in most Haitian household, um, they bring a little bit of the Caribbean with them. And so I, I remember in the early 90s, people would kind of sneak plants on, on the plane um, to make sure they brought some, some kind of home with them. Uh -huh. And so, yeah, so, so I, I don't have plants in the house, but if you go to my backyard, there's like trees in the backyard that has fruits and stuff. Morel, do you, do you mind talking a little bit about the plants that are in your studio? Um, yeah, sure. Um, so in my studio, um, for those of you that kind of joined from earlier, um, I have a money tree in the studio. It's a small money tree next to the window. <laughs> And oh, so I got the noise. I have a money tree, and then I also have a bird of paradise, um, which is another plant in the studio. And then I have a a fig tree in the back. And so the bird of paradise and the fig tree are not actually real; they're fake, but they're they're from a company that makes them appear very real. Does, oh, so you're saying that the fig tree was fake? Oh man, that would have been yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah the, fig, the, the fig tree and the bird of paradise are both fake, but if you see them up close, um, you would confuse them for being real. Yeah, yeah, I, I, yeah I during the first time you're showing us, they look very real. <laughs> <laughs> you had mentioned um, that you had had a real plants, but what, uh, what happened with those? Um, do you want to tell that story? Oh yeah, I can. So I did have real plants in the studio. Um, so at the bakehouse, we have a gentleman named Joe who lives on the premise. And so I put the plants out to get some sunlight um, before the quarantine. And when I came back, um, Joe had added them to his garden. And so I, I could have, you know, gone through the hassle of digging them back up. And so I just, you know what, 
they're part of the 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 um, life of the studio, and so Joe can have them. And so I just got me some fake plants instead. <laughs> All right, cool. So this is kind of like the basic stencil right now. But again, because it was wet, it'll be a little bit kind of um, muddy. But this something like this does not really bother me. Um, and so from there, this is one technique you can do with the, with the stencil. Uh, for the stencil, you can cut them out on plastic, on cardboard, um, whatever material you, you can find. The um, thinner the paper, the, um, the stencil, the um, better. And then another technique that you can do is using the actual leaves. And so with the leaves, um, you know, you just wanna grab something, you know, very clean, and then you're gonna slowly take the, the paint and apply the application onto the leaf. And so you wanna kinda cover just enough of it. Morel, uh, I wanted to ask you a few questions from our audience. Yeah, sure. Uh, can one is a bit lighthearted. They're asking whether you're on TikTok, and if not, would you consider it as a platform to document your artistic practice? Oh, wow. Um, I'm not on TikTok. Um, I do enjoy watching other videos on there. Um, I, I, I have seen a few artists um, have done well on that platform. So maybe I might look into it. So, so what you mean to say is you're not on TikTok yet. <laughs> yes, yeah, <laughs> yeah. And so once you have the, your leaf painted, uh, you could choose a part of your composition, lay it down. So for me, again, I like using the roller. If you don't have one, you can use your, the palm of your hand or the, the wrist. And from there, just kind of gently roll the texture on. You can do it one time, you can do it twice. And then from there, so this is twice, it's a little bit muddy. So maybe for this leaf, it makes sense to do it one time. So that way you have more definition. Um, but again, you know, it's very spontaneous. Sometimes you have a good, a good print, other times you don't. Um, so it's just part of the process. Um, this paper is still wet. So the paint kind of is a little bit kind of muddy. Um, but this is one I did prior that has a better kind of imprint here. Um, so I would definitely recommend um, to kind of wait until your paper is, is dry so you have a much more better definition of the imprint as you're kind of going forward. Um, and then, you know, I kind of, you know, use other things. You know, if you're using some watercolor, you can use some salt to create some really cool effects. Um, I also ordered some, like, glitter for paint. Um, you have some other things you can add to the work to kind of create um, some other kind of energy in the work. So just kind of having fun, you know, um, each, each leaf give a different pattern. These are some things from a palm tree, the seeds from that. So that can make a cool um, texture or imprint in the work. Um, and so I think for me, um, most of my favorite pieces are the ones where the texture looks cool, but you can't tell from what plant I made the texture with. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Do you have any dream plants that you like really wish that you could get your hands on? Oh, if I could get my hands on some plants, um, there's, I'll probably, if I had the money, probably get me a bonsai tree. I think those trees are very incredible. Mm -hmm. um, and if you take care of it, um, you can really kind of pass it on from one generation to the next. Nice. Very nice. Yeah, I've, um, Flamingo Road Nursery up in Davie has um, like an entire little bonsai tree area that you can, um, uh, they have one seller there who has, I don't know, 50 plus different kinds of bonsai. And I love going and looking at those. I don't think I'm a good enough plant parent to actually take out bonsai, but <laughs> no, they, I love they require idea. a lot of work, like to shape them and do all that stuff, right? To the bonsai? Or not necessarily. I don't know. I just know they're kind of expensive, and I, I I don't trust myself to invest that much into. A yeah, they're not they're not cheap at all. <laughs> um, but if you if you know how to take care of one, um, they're very beautiful. Mm hmm Moral, what do you um? So obviously we're all in quarantine right now, but I'm curious to know like what is like the first thing that you're excited to do once um quarantine has been lifted. Oh. I think, so my birthday is coming up in June. Um, 
And so I'm thinking of doing like a quick camping on the beach near the um, West Coast. So I might go out maybe to um, Everglades National Park and kind of camp out there for for the night. Um, so for you know, for me again, you know, um, I've never been there overnight, and so it'll be really cool to kind of sit in in that space and kind of really take that in. Oh, that's so cool. Do you um, also like birds, um, Morel? Um, yes, um, I. So I um so my um back in Haiti there used to be a um parrot that would visit my um my farm for my grandfather. And so um I do like birds. I think they're very I think you know, this the idea of kind of flight, you know, being able to travel when and where you want is really incredible. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the bird watching in the Everglades is really cool. So Grace, which would you rather do go to the beach or go to the Everglades? Um, so I am very pale, so much so that, um, <laughs> as, as you can notice, the background um, of my walls are kind of cream colored as well. So I can't do a Zoom background because I get absorbed <laughs> into the background. So it's <laughs> out for me. <laughs> um, <laughs> but um, I have been to the Everglades down cor- uh, closer near to Homestead, um, and it, it's like pretty beautiful. I would definitely go again um, with a lot of protective sun gear and yeah. wear. Um, but I, I, you know, we um, are big proponents of Jim Cooper, James Cooper, the artist who was the first um, director of the museum at FAU. And a lot of his work has, or these beautiful landscapes of the Everglades. So that like has inspired me to want to go explore there a little bit more. So yeah, so I'm with you, Morel, to go to the Everglades. Yeah, so I think, um, one of my, a few of my dream trips um, that I would love to do once things get a little bit back to normal um, would probably be visit the Grand Canyon. Um, I would like to go to Yosemite National Park and kind of take in the, the, the scene over there. Oh, those sound like great trips. Um, and actually, uh, our director just sent me a question for you, Morel. Um, she would like to know, have you ever thought about making handmade books? Is this like a medium you've thought about kind of, you know, dabbling in or anything like that? Um, I actually have this randomly. I have, I, um, when I was back at MICA, um, I took many, many classes. Um, I graduated with like almost 40 credits that I did not need. And one of those classes was actually book art. Um, and so I have book making, ex- I've, I've done books in the past. Okay. Cool, very cool. We have another question. Um, Talking about technique, um, I think this is maybe going back to um, something previously you asked, has there been a piece that's been more challenging than others to create um, in terms of like selecting material, color, texture, or anything um, that you've used to help um, communicate your message? Um, I think out of the work I've done to date, um, my, so I have one large installation called clockwork and that piece um the scale is about 10 feet by 10 feet it it can go up to 12 feet by 12 feet um that's the largest piece i've done to date and that was very um challenging coming up with the engineering and the rig structure to kind of make that project happen i mean so so i think you know for me um one thing i've learned that worked well for me is you can still create scale by using things that are small. So through a lot of my other works, even though they might be smaller in size, I create multiple. So it creates the illusion that is a large work. Mm. Like with the ceramics that you were showing us, right? Yes. Mm-hmm. Cool. So I'm curious, Morel Grace, have you guys picked up any weird habits during the quarantine that like are unexpected? <laughs> Um, I know for me, maybe it's not a weird habit, but it, it's weird. It's a weird for me habit, um, reading. Um, I'm not a reader. I'm not a reader. Um, I think a lot of people think I am, which is to my benefit, but um, I have accidentally joined a book club. I know some of my book club friends are watching. Um, so we're reading, uh, we've been reading a lot of female focused memoirs. That's just been the theme so far. So I'm actually, I'm, I'm, I'm happy with that new quarantine habit, that new weird quarantine habit. What about you, Morel? 
Um, so actually, I've, it's not really weird, but I've been cooking more. Um, and so um, I have a, a small group of friends on Instagram that if you like, if you like other day, I'll post a new video of me making a new meal. And so I've just been kind of, I've been focusing on the keto kind of diet. It's been kind of hard to stay on track because there's no carbs allowed um, for it. Um, but just been really a joy being able to, you know, buy things from local farmers from down the street and then kind of making a meal out of it. What's your favorite thing that you've made so far? Oh, <laughs> I've made a lot. Um, I think, so I'm not even really like a meat person, but I've, I've started, um, I tried out a um, lamb um, the other day. So it was some lamb, some okra, um, some breadfruit. Um, some like collard greens. It was really, really good. That sounds amazing. <laughs> that sounds amazing. <laughs> Marianna, I, I know you're a baker, Mariana. What have you yeah. been doing up to? Um, you know, I've been just dabbling. Like, I think what really hit me um, a few weeks ago, I found this article in like the New York Times cooking section and the subject was like, recipes for people who hate to do the dishes. <laughs> <laughs> I started going through that list because <laughs> um, I really hate the dishes. But um, from that, one of the cool things, which I think you would like this one, Grace, um, uh, it is a winter squash and mushroom curry. Um, it's all vegetarian and um, it's really delicious. I use like a butternut squash and um, that I've been playing around with a lot of curries actually um, for some reason. Uh, it just like tastes really good right now. So yeah, those have been a few of the things. Yeah that I've been, been playing with. Um, I didn't jump on the sourdough starter though. Like, um, <laughs> we got a cat, I already have a pet. I don't need to have to tend to sourdough every day. <laughs> uh, I'm gonna um, charge the phone. It's kind of low in battery, which is why I keep okay. cutting off the camera. Okay. All right, cool. All right, cool, yeah. So this is kind of, again, kind of adding more technique. Um, so you can see for me, I'm very spontaneous. I don't really plan it out just kind of go over the flow. Um, and so I think, you know, by keeping that same kind of energy of adding different layers onto the work. Um, and so when, once I'm done, and I might stop here, and then I might go back and add a figure, I might collage something else on top of it. Um, and then this could be like a small piece I would pin on the wall. And then I can think about it. And then from, from here, it will become a different piece. Morel, and then maybe, maybe you mentioned this, but what kind of paint are you using? Um, let me check it out. It's a new paint that I've tried out. So they're called, I'm trying to just show the name to the audience. This is the name of the paint. What's in it it's called? a new, yeah. And so it comes in the, in the box like this. Um, so there's like different sizes, different color palettes, and the bottles are about this big. And so, you know, for me, I'm getting back in, into paint. This is probably the first time I've painted in the past two years since I've been working with ceramic. Um, we got another question kind of related to this um, from one of our um, viewers. Um, would you consider making pigments from plants to use for like paint? Um, I've done um, a few um, paints. So some of my papers are dyed using the flower. And so what I do is I take the flower and I put it in a pot almost like it almost like a tea and then I take the tea and I stain the paper with it so like a so you make a tea from the flower okay cool yeah mm -hmm. cool. I know a lot of people do like tie-dye and stuff with that too like with the pigments of paints but mm -hmm. well what um are you reading anything right now because we're talking about book clubs oh um yeah so right now um there's a book by Jack Whitman. Um, it's essentially like a book, kind of his personal diary of things kind of written down. Um, I have a friend um, who has a book, who, who had that book. Um, he, he's reading it right now too. And I think, you know, it's really incredible being able to go behind the working of an artist's mind and seeing their challenges, how they've overcome it, and certain ideas that were expressed from a, a decade ago and how it's still kind of prevalent to what is going on um, now. Um, you know, um, I've been, you know, mainly trying to keep myself sane. You know, I think um, 
within media, especially in the last 42 hours with like the um, death of African Americans in the media and how they're, you know, with the, the police and things like that. I think, you know, I try to take a break from that, you know, because over a while, you know, it becomes overwhelming. And so I try to keep myself busy in other ways. Yeah, I feel like that that is something that, you know, we all kind of struggle with at times is balancing being a good citizen and knowing what's happening in the world, but also making sure that we're taking good care of ourselves and um, not getting too, um, you know, obsessed with what's happening in the news at times, because I know at least I've gone down those spirals before, new spirals. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Well, I'm glad that, um, yeah, you, you're recognizing that and taking a little time for yourself. Um, yeah. It's, it's all about, you know, some kind of balance. You know, it's important that you're present and understand what is going on. But at the same time, you know, self-care is very important. Definitely. What, else do you, what else do you do more off for um, self-care, especially during like this? So time? I've been um, jogging and doing three miles walk, walk um, for the past couple of weeks. And so when I get bored or unmotivated, I try to drag one of my friends with me. Um, so whoever is one of my victims in the coming week, I'll just let them know. Um, so just being more, much more kind of active, um, I go to different neighborhoods, um, explore, you know, um, just, you know, just trying to keep my mind kind of going, you know? So speaking of the different neighborhoods and communities, um, we have another question um, from Facebook Live. Um, do you consider um, your carbon footprint works as documentation, and are you interested in historic historicizing these Miami communities, or is it more about exploring the native fauna, or both? They're a um, combination of both. You know, I think with neighborhoods, for example, like Overtown, Miami, um, you know, with Overtown, it was a thriving center um, for Black excellence. And then um, when I-95 was built through that neighborhood, it completely altered the way of life. Um, and so I think um, with time, um, some of these neighborhoods that I'm documenting and I'm going into, some of them may not exist anymore. Um, right now, you know, I, I live on the cusp of El Portal, Little Haiti, in that kind of area. And there's a whole new branding called Magic City that is happening with developers, you know. And so you have a community of Haitians who essentially have contributed to the culture and landscape here of South Florida, and they're being slowly eroded and taken off the map through development of this new kind of bigger, fresher idea. And I don't feel like, you know, we're being considered or involved in what is going on, you know? So I think um, it's very important that, you know, as artists, we try to buy property because um, that's the only way we can combat the development going on. Um, if you don't own your property, if you don't own your studio, then you're at the mercy of developers. Wherever they tell you to go is where you, you, you're going to have to go, unless you have the um, capital to afford the, the um, space. Yeah. Uh, well, thank you so much, Morel. Um, I'm gonna see, so I, um... Do, Grace, uh, do you have, can we see what you've created um, right now? Okay, so right now, still very much a bunch of leaves on the paper, still drying. <laughs> so what I've been doing with this is that um, I have these bricks that I've gotten outside and I'll like lay them on top to add some pressure so that way it really imprints. Um, but um, I did do a previous example and this is, oh, wow. so I used, you can see some of the leaf um, imprints and then I used um, this is some moss that I got an air plant as a gift and I kind of did a silhouette of my friend dog my friend's dog that's honey golden retriever so I know I was somewhat inspired by the different profiles um, that um, Morel was using um, so I, I used a little honey here so yeah what do, what do you, let's see yours, Mariana. Um, so mine, so mine, I've been playing with since this morning. So I did, um, I don't even know, you can see. At first I did like a watercolor um, abstract wash and then I added some of the leaves just now, um, painted the backside of these like Tibuccino leaves that have the really thick veins and just painted those blue and kind of like stamped it, you know, pressured it on. And so I think these ones gave a really good impression. And then I had some stencils as well that I tried 
to overlay, but with the, I had the water or the paints a little too like runny. And so it wasn't like a nice clear definition, but um, I definitely have a few that I'm going to continue playing with and trying to, trying to build these up. Um, and definitely for anyone that followed along with us today, we would love to see what you created. Um, tag us at Frost Art Museum on Instagram or Facebook. Um, we'd like to see the, the creations you've made with leaves. And Morel, um, do you have any final words before we um, wrap this up? Um, sure. Um, so if there's any educators in the chat, um, I do have this activity as a PDF if you guys want to try it out in the classroom. Um, so just reach out to me through email, through my DMs, and I'll send you a PDF of the lesson plan. Um, thank you so much, um, Amy, the rest of the team. Um, you guys are incredible. I think um, what different institutions are doing during this time for artists, um, the way you guys are supporting us, um, we're very much thankful and appreciative of what is going on. And, you know, we, you know, I think, um, you know, artists, here in Miami, a lot of us are working and it's up to the institutions to really bring that platform to us. Um, many of the older artists kind of left the scene, went to New York, went to LA. But I think right now there's a mecca of talent here in the city. And I think, you know, as more institutions kind of open up their doors um, to more exhibition opportunities, um, to more discussions, to more talk, um, it can kind of bring a global eye back to the city um, outside of Art, of art Basel, Miami, because during Art Basel, there's the oversaturation of other um, fairs and, and, other, um, and, and, and other people here in the space. But I think if inst institutions can really use um, the rest of the year to really highlight local artists, give them like, you know, shows, like even like um, Terrence Price had a show at the Frost. Um, I, didn't, I haven't had a chance to go, but I've seen the reviews, I've seen the pictures, it's looking um, really much incredible. So I think uh, as we more- We have a virtual tour, tour of it, Morel, if you would uh, like to take a virtual tour, a 360 um, video of uh, Terrence. Oh, okay, wow. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, so, so, so I, you know, I just say, you know, that's thank you to institutions that continue to um, do that, even Pam. Um, brought a few works from local galleries here in the city um, a couple weeks ago. Um, so all of those, you know, are, are blessings. And the more of that kind of generosity that goes out, the more that gets back, the more it gets put back into the city. Definitely. Um, we have one, I'm going to actually, we have one last question that I'm going to throw out so that we can, um, as our final question, um, we had a viewer ask, where in um, Miami do you like to view art? Like, where, where do you go? Oh, wow. Um, it depends on the, um, it's a mix, you know, I think, you know, Pam, um, ICA Miami, MoCA, I think, you know, I think all the museums and gallery um, have something compelling to offer. It depends on what is your taste, you know, if you want um, work that is more kind of contemporary, kind of challenging the status quo. I think Spinello Project does a really great job of putting exhibitions at that capacity. Um, if you want to look at um, works from Black artists, I think Namdi Contemporary um, has an amazing roster of artists um, that are of African descent. Um, you know, if you like ceramic work, many, many Solomon. So I think it depends what is your um, taste. You know, I think um, through events like Progressive Brunch um, that happens like every, like once a month on a Sunday is an opportunity for you to travel around different parts of the city, check out a new gallery, meet new people. So I think there's always opportunities. Um, if, you're, if, you, if, if you feel like you're not an artist, if you're not part of the scene, um, there's always opportunities for you to engage with galleries, with, with, with other artists. I think, you know, as artists, you know, so much of the work we do is part of the community. So if you want to engage, um, more than often, you're gonna find an artist who's willing to invite you into their studio. Um, so just, I think this acts, you know, acts, you know, sometime, um, like during the quarantine, I've been sliding into artists DM who I've admire, and I've been FaceTiming them out of the blue. Um, and sometimes it works, sometimes it don't, but at least I know I tried, you know? Yeah, definitely. Okay, Morel, thank you so much. We really appreciate your time today and leading us in this activity. And we'll get um, that activity sheet up um, on our website um, 
today or tomorrow so that, um, like you said, educators could follow along. And I would just love to thank my colleagues as well for joining us today, Amy, Carmen, Grace, and JC, um, and Wesley. Thank you all so much. Um, and we hope you all have a um, safe and wonderful evening. Thank you. All right, thank you.